Swati Sathe, I'm a neurologist and medical director at CHDI Management and CHDI Foundation. Uh, CHDI Foundation is a non-profit biomedical research organization devoted to Huntington's disease. Uh, the mission of the organization is to accelerate drug development for Huntington's disease uh, that provide meaningful clinical benefit to patients as early as possible. Uh, and the acceleration is mediated through preclinical, translational, and clinical avenues. Uh, today we'll be focusing on biomarker development and especially as it how it relates to Huntington's disease, Huntington's disease and how uh, CHDI efforts are geared towards um, the biomarker development. So biomarker is a biological parameter that can be measured. Uh, it is an indicator of uh, a normal biological process or pathology or it can uh, indicate a response to exposure or intervention. It can be derived from uh, molecular, histologic, radiologic, or physiologic characteristics. And especially for chronic diseases uh, like Huntington's disease that span over several decades, uh, there is an urgent need for biomarkers that can accurately predict the stage of the disease and predict progression and can interpret improvement in therapy over shorter periods of time. There are a number of common biomarkers in use. Uh, as an example, you know, white blood cell count to judge uh, response to infection or you know, recovery from infection, blood glucose, uh, prostate-specific antigen, and so on and so forth. There are different types of biomarkers that we use uh, uh, in clinical practice as well as research. Uh, the biomarker could be a diagnostic biomarker that indicates the presence of a disease. It can be used to monitor a disease. It can be used to uh, indicate if there, there's target engagement by a therapeutic agent. It can indicate the pharmacodynamic change uh, in, in an individual because of an agent. It can predict whether a particular individual is more susceptible to, their, uh, to the disease or more likely to respond to an uh, intervention. It can indicate the prognosis of any disease. Uh, it can indicate the safety of the drug being used. Uh, and a particular biomarker may serve in a variety of ways. It doesn't, doesn't translate to one biomarker and one use. In fact, most biomarkers indicate several things in the same patient. Now, what is a clinical outcome assessment? So clinical outcome assessment is very distinct from a biomarker. It's a direct measure of how a person feels, functions, or survives. Uh, and this is the definition that is used by regulatory agencies uh, as a indication that any therapy or intervention is working because there is a change in the patient in, in how the patient feels functions or survives uh, they have to be derived from things that are important to the patient and only a clinical outcome assessment is traditionally used um, as a standard for regulatory approval of therapeutics now biomarkers can provide links between the disease process and the clinical outcome assessment and for that for that reason, uh, the biomarker has to undergo uh, an analytical validation as well as qualification. So analytical validation just indicates the process that any test must undergo uh, to, to set a standard that it is um, uh, accurate, it is precise, it is reliable, it is reproducible, and it undergoes the quality standards uh, for the test being valid. Whereas qualification is more of a evidence-based process where it is established that a particular biomarker uh, is, is correlated to the disease in whichever manner it is proposed to be used. Either it is proposed to be used as a progression marker or a staging marker, but there is a uh, evidence-based process to show that uh, that qualification as a biomarker is, uh, it, it exists and it is established. Only when these two processes occur, the third process where you have to, uh, where there's utilization, and again, the utilization is, it's a conceptual, uh, it's a contextual thing uh, where it is established that in the given context, a validated and a qualified biomarker can be used to um, indicate a specific change uh, in the uh, disease process and can be linked to a clinical outcome assessment. When all of these procedures have occurred, a biomarker may be used, uh, may be used by a regulatory authority uh, for drug approval. Now, an endpoint is usually a clinical outcome assessment because it is directly related to the patient function. 
but the endpoint is traditionally a variable, um, like you said, mostly a clinical outcome assessment that is intended to be used by the researchers or the investigators in a particular study to indicate that if the intervention or the drug is working in that patient in that manner uh, with specific uh, statistical an analysis applied to that, to that clinical outcome assessment. So for a clinical outcome assessment to be used as an endpoint, it has to undergo further characterization as to what is the precise definition. Uh, you know, for, for example, if it is a congestive heart failure study, an exercise tolerance is a clinical outcome assessment because that is directly related to the patient's function. Then for a study, there are several definitions that need to be assigned in the sense, what kind of exercise tolerance is being measured? Who are the patients in, in whom it is being measured? What is the degree of uh, impairment that needs to happen before the patient can enter into the study? What is the degree of improvement that needs to happen as a result of patient being in the study? In what manner would this exercise tolerance be measured? So you have to specify the tests. Now those tests again have to be validated. And uh, when, at what points will the measurements occur and how long will the study be? And other statistical issues related to the same patient being, um, you know, having to do the test over and over again. So once all of these backdrop is qualified, then a clinical outcome assessment can become a endpoint. Now for a biomarker to become an endpoint, we have to go through the additional step of showing that the biomarker is clearly related or correlated with the clinical outcome assessment of interest. And as we discussed before, it has to undergo all the processes of uh, analytical validation, qualification, and utilization. So how then can biomarkers be used in drug development? Other than being an endpoint, when a biomarker becomes an endpoint, we call it a surrogate endpoint. But other than being an endpoint for a study, biomarkers are used in different stages of drug development. Uh, as we spoke about, they can be used to demonstrate that the drug target is playing a role in the disease process, that the target validation is okay. It can be used in three clinical studies for screening of compounds to see uh, if there is a, a target uh, validation and if, it is, uh, if there is any promise of efficacy and safety. It can be used in pharmacodynamic assays. It can be used for patient stratification in clinical trials, uh, indicating what stage of the disease uh, can be used in inclusion exclusion criteria and so on and so forth. So that brings us to the Huntington disease, which is the topic of interest today. Uh, Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant trinucleotide repeat neurodegenerative disease. It is caused by expansion of the CAG trinucleotide in exon 1 of uh, Huntington gene, which lies on chromosome 4. Now, the CAG translates to polyglutamine, and therefore expansion of the CAG translates to a polyglutamine chain in the Huntington pro protein. Uh, which is abnormal and uh, as a toxic gain of function as the mechanism of disease uh, genesis. The normal number of repeats in the CAG are considered to be less than 26. So in a normal individual, both alleles of the Huntington disease will have less than 26 CAG repeats. When the repeats on one of those alleles is between 27 and 35, uh, it is a pre-mutation or called an intermediate allele. This individual is not expected to, to have any uh, pathology or signs or symptoms related to Huntington disease, however, can transmit a longer repeat to the next generation. When the transmitting parent is the father, the, the likelihood of expansion is higher. When the repeats are between 36 and 39, they are called incomplete penetrants, meaning that not all individuals with those repeat numbers will actually in their lifetime develop signs, symptoms related to Huntington disease or pathology related to Huntington disease. Repeats beyond 40 are considered pathogenic, such that any individual with more than 40 repeats is more than not likely to develop signs and symptoms and pathology of Huntington disease in their lifetime. Length of the CAG repeat is inversely related to the age of onset of the disease. Uh, the disease is characterized by psychological, behavioral, motor, and cognitive symptoms, those occurring in that chronology. The lifetime expectation beyond the onset of motor symptoms is about uh, 15 years, 15 to 20 years. Uh, the motor hallmark of Huntington disease is chorea. For a long time, the disease was known as Huntington's chorea. And there are a number of therapies at the moment uh, in development uh, for Huntington's disease, uh, including antisense oligonucleotide therapy as well as gene therapy. 
So here, this particular slide shows the stages of Huntington disease as well as the relevance of biomarkers uh, in the uh, process. So it's a, Huntington is essentially a very prolonged um, time course where uh, for the first two or three or four decades of life, there are not uh, too many symptoms or not much of functional impairment. The average uh, age of motor onset, which probably corresponds to clinical diagnosis in several cases, uh, is in the early 40s. Now, prior to that, uh, although there are no uh, definitive manifestations of the disease, uh, there are certainly changes in um, the neuronal function or uh, neural dysfunction, so to say. And therefore, what we would like is a biomarker, and that's the dark line that's shown over here, that would be that could be measured or that is uh, identified several years before the clinical diagnosis and as you can see that it rises uh, as the time course go by, uh, as the time course goes along and therefore that would be a very useful measure also to stage a particular disease and then the dotted line shows that if the biomarker changes with intervention uh, if there is early intervention and then it comes uh, the level comes back to the almost normal state or even beyond when even if there's a late intervention and it, we can shift the curve of the biomarker, this is how, uh, this is a biomarker that would be very useful in clinical trials. Um, it also shows, this slide also shows the current limitations of the rating scales where you can see that unless uh, for a very long period of, the, period of time, the clinical rating scales or the clinical assessments are not able to pick up any deficits in the Huntington patients. Now, if we were to use this as a clinical outcome assessment and as an endpoint in a clinical trial, uh, that would cause a lot of limitation as we would miss a number of people who are already showing changes pathologically or even physiologically and are not picked up by these rating scales. Uh, whereas a biomarker would stand to uh, provide that bridge or close that gap between the clinical assessment uh, and the uh, detection of pathology in those patients. So clearly there's a need for new biomarkers uh, so that we can better define the asymptomatic or the prodromal or the pre-manifest phase of the phenotypic uh, spectrum of Huntington's disease. And once that we have been able to pick that up, whether we can predict the course of the disease so that we can stratify patients for enrollment into studies or predict uh, the likelihood of uh, benefit of the intervention uh, in these patients. Most of the trials at the moment are initiated after motor diagnosis, mostly because the way the uh, rating scales are constructed. If there is no change in the rating scale, if there is no motor finding, uh, then there is no possibility of showing a change after intervention. And therefore, we, by, if we are using one of the motor rating scales or like UHDRS as an endpoint, there is almost a need to have some finding on that scale. Therefore, patients are recruited after they have motor findings, which is after their motor diagnosis. And uh, a, a reliable uh, uh, biomarker or a biomarker that is validated and qualified may be able to close that gap. The picture just shows uh, the long time between birth and motor onset and a relatively short time after or for, uh, of the lifespan after motor onset and the need for intervening before uh, the uh, obvious motor phenomena. Briefly about the Enroll HD platform, it is a large multimodal collaborative integrated clinical research platform that was started in 2012. Um, Enroll HD is a longitudinal observational study within uh, the Enroll HD platform uh, that collects data on Huntington disease participants as well as controls in a longitudinal manner in an annual visit with standardized tests and assessments. Uh, the study is ongoing with 169 sites in four countries. It has over 23,000 participants and over 13 million data points um, related to uh, study collection. Now using that Enroll HD study as a platform, uh, we have some planned and ongoing biomarker work. The biomarkers proposed in this field um, are again, uh, very diverse, starting from neuroimaging to wet biomarkers, to Huntington lowering uh, biomarkers and so on. Uh, as we said, the biomarker can be derived from, uh, from, a, from any of the measurements. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, 
and it doesn't necessarily have to be biochemical. Uh, along with that, if we have more than one biomarkers that are closely related to the clinical course, you can always use a combination uh, of biomarkers uh, to, in fact, establish the uh, reliability uh, and the reproducibility of them. So now, based on that, we have um, HD Clarity study, which was started as a nested study within the Endul HD platform. Uh, here, patients are invited to contribute a CSF and a plasma sample on an annual basis. Patients are stratified based on the stage of their Huntington's disease. And the Enroll HD data will provide the phenotypic data. The CSF sample will provide uh, the uh, source for analytes. And this will, be a, a, this will be a very strong study to determine the correlation between a uh, analyte or a biomarker detected in the CSF and the phenotype of the patient. Now, this is just some early data showing the enrollment in HD clarity. Uh, we have more than 500 patients uh, enrolled so far and over 100 patients who have contributed uh, longitudinal samples. And how do we uh, intend to analyze uh, the study? So these are the objectives of HD clarity. Uh, primarily, we would like to do a hypothesis-driven study of candidate biomarkers um, chosen from previous literature uh, of neurodegenerative disease as well as Huntington disease and validate those, uh, whether they uh, can be used as reliable markers for Huntington disease. Uh, NFL and mutant Huntington have already been studied in numerous studies and further valid validation is required in large longitudinal studies, which is something that HD Clarity offers. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it, will, it will be a biorepository for all stakeholders in the community who can take advantage of the samples. Once the analyses are completed, we intend to make it available as a uh, resource for the entire community uh, as a standardized uh, panel or a standardized um, instrument that can be used to, uh, in any clinical trial, as a, a baseline assessment or as a um, uh, as baseline values so that the individual stakeholders do not have to repeat those assessments and do not have to carry on uh, studies of their own since this is a very uh, valuable resource and we do not want it to be wasted. Now, on top of image clar uh, HD clarity, we have the image clarity study where patients or participants in the uh, HD clarity study are invited to get an annual MRI uh, and maybe every six months MRI in the first couple of years. Uh, the MRI uh, sequences selected for image clarity are state of the art and likely to yield maximum information regarding the structure as well as some aspects of functional MRI. Uh, again, we have a correlation now between the phenotypic data provided by Enroll HD, the CSF and the blood uh, biochemical data or proteomic data, whichever are generated through the biosamples of HD clarity, and now imaging data linked uh, to, to the uh, to the CSF and the phenotypic data. And therefore, the chances of finding a strong biomarker are progressively increased because of these linked studies. Now, another study that is um, slated to begin shortly is actually a PET study uh, that is selective for mutant Huntington. So there are two PET tracers that are uh, selectively expected to bind only to the mutant Huntington, uh, as it is shown on the slide panel on the right. Uh, so you have a wild type mouse that is indicated by WT and the ha Huntington expansion mouse on the right side. And it shows the effect of the, or the binding of the tracer uh, at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months in these mice. And as we can see on the left side, the, the specific mutant Huntington tracer has no binding in all four panels, uh, there's no change. Whereas in the Huntington mouse, as time goes by from three months to 13 months, there is progressively increased uh, uptake of the tracer uh, that leads to a hot spot or change in color as orange here. And therefore it indicates that the two things, it indicates that the mutant Huntington is increasingly getting deposited in the Huntington mouse model and that the tracer is able to pick up that increasing deposition uh, and indicate the severity of um, mutant Huntington um, in the brain of these mouse model. Now, hopefully that translates to human beings. Uh, as, as I said, this study is slated to show, begin shortly. Uh, it will use the two tracers as a first in human study. 
and um, hopefully uh, if that this materializes into a Huntington selective pet tracer and if that if the study is successful that would be a very big contribution to the field uh, it will almost be like the tau uh, pet study in alzheimer's disease which has changed the um, alzheimer field uh, in, in terms of ability to diagnose patients uh, before they are symptomatic or um, uh, look for uh, target engagement in therapeutic trial or stratify patients in the therapeutic trial we expect a similar kind of impact uh, should the tracer be successful in humans uh, for Huntington disease with respect, with respect to mutant Huntington. Uh, there are several other uh, initiatives within CHDI, but uh, for this particular presentation, I think uh, we will end with this. Thank you.